One minute left. I'm going to turn on my video to say hello. I can't actually see my video, assuming that works. There I am. Oh, and it is 11 o'clock. Terry Reese, are we ready? I need to do a short introduction. I just want to make sure you're ready. Yep, I'm ready. Marvelous. I'll have just a few words of introduction and then we will get started. Thank you everyone for being here on day two of the Evergreen Online Conference. I just want to take a moment and thank our sponsors. I guess I should introduce myself. I am Jennifer Weston, Product and Education Manager at Equinox, also facilitator of the Fine Cataloging Interest Group for the Evergreen community, along with many of the organizing members who are here today. So thanks to all of you. Do you want to Finish my thank you to the sponsors, our champion level sponsors, ECDI, the Evergreen Community Development Initiative, who is a sponsor of closed captioning, Equinox, sponsor of the platform, Kipu, who is the sponsor of Hackfest tomorrow, and we were just talking about how you can join that, and a very special thank you today to Pales Spark, the Pennsylvania Consortium, who is sponsoring today's invited speaker. That said, I am thrilled to introduce Terry Reese who is currently the head of digital initiatives and infrastructure support at the Ohio State University Libraries, but most importantly to us, the creator of MarkEdit and a ledger, legend in the cataloging world since, oh, about 2000. So I am not going to do much more of an introduction there other than to say on behalf of the tens of thousands of users of Mark, er, MarkEdit to date, we are so very, very honored to have you with us today, Terry Reese, and I am going to offer up to you the opportunity to share your screen and I will be quiet and say thank you again. Great. So thank you. Thank you. So I am going to start to get this out of the way because the dog. So I'm at my house and there's the dog. She, uh, I'm going to do this now because she tends to jump in the middle of presentations. And so if I do this at the beginning, she seems to think her job is done and then she'll leave me alone. So <laughs> nice. She likes to, to visit when we're, I'm working. Oh, I can't screen share. Can you give me the? I can. Yeah, Actually, I, just, I just need to stop. Yeah, I think if I stop, you should be able to. Oh, perfect. And you missed the important part about what is your dog's name? Ah, so my dog's name is Mabel. So she okay. is the unofficial uh, mascot of, uh, unofficial mascot of the application. And I will, I guess, talk a little bit about that. All right, so I have some slides and I will, make these available to folks as we go along um, but afterwards. I'm going to bounce in and out of my slides um, just because that's kind of the way that I do this and my intention is to um, have a fairly condensed um, kind of uh, discussion and then I'd like to leave room at the end for folks to ask any questions or you know any kind of specific things that they might have questions about that have come up and so what I ended up doing for this particular session, as I reviewed kind of my email over the last um, year and kind of pulled out some things that were common threads that people ask about, um, just to kind of cover some things because these I there are parts of the application some that have been around for a while, some that have, are rel more relatively new because they have um, they've had changes. Uh, some of them are more important now because we have more folks who. Um, are utilizing Unicode rather than uh, Mark 8, or you have um, communities where, like for example, at Ohio State, we, we our catalog is Unicode, but we get a lot of data from other places that are not in Unicode. They're from a variety of different encodings. So we have workflows for processing data into other things. So talk about a couple of different things, um, and then leave some room at the end um, for folks to ask questions and feel free to to ask questions as we go. I'm, I will try and kind of keep an eye on, well, I don't know how easy it'll be for me to keep an eye on the chat. I'll, I'll keep an um, eye on the chat for you. Okay, great. We actually have two different chats going, one in Feedless and one in Zoom, so we'll uh, monitor perfect. for you. So yeah, so if you have a question, feel free to uh, interrupt. I'm, I'm not too worried about that. All right, so the first thing that I want to talk about um, is kind of what's on the horizon before I get too far along, because I'm in the process of doing um, uh, a lot of uh, recoding on the application. Um, the uh, it's been it's been um, about two and a half years since the program's you know uh, set on I think it's seven point six right now, um, and so um, I've been taking a, a long look at kind of where different parts of the 
the application are at right now and then thinking about the ways that um, some of the questions I've gotten some of the, the the ways that hopefully I can make the, the program work a little bit easier for folks and so I thought I'd go through kind of a couple of the the highlights kind of things that I'm working on right now um, some of these I expect most of these things to finish um, before around the end of the summer that's kind of what I'm targeting um, and there's some um, actual reasons for for that but that's kind of the goal so uh, the first thing I'll be doing in market is moving the application to .NET 8. So right now it's using long-term supported version of .NET 6. That'll fall out of support in November, which is why the end of summer is kind of the, the process for that. Um, .NET 8 is the next long-term support version, so it'll be the way Microsoft supports um, .NET instances. Long-term support lasts for, I believe, three years, and so that gives me uh, three years on that particular um, runtime, um, which then is guaranteed to support the, the, pre, the next runtimes, but um, is backwards compatible. So that makes a lot of sense for me. So that's coming. Um, I'm looking to refresh the interface, and I'm, I'm gonna talk about exactly what I mean by that. So I get a lot of questions because MarkEdit gets used in um, classroom settings. And so the application has always taken the approach because it's, I use the application myself that I put everything, um, there's a lot of stuff in it, um, a lot of stuff in the interface. And I've tried to make it more um, straightforward as kind of we've gone wrong, but as the program gets, as the program has been around, and it's been around now for 23 years or so, um, there's just a lot of stuff that gets stuffed into it. So one of the things that I'm looking to do with the interface this time around um, is I'm looking to create um, uh, essentially what are user profiles. And so they'll be kind of a simplified interface um, that includes kind of the most common used parts of the application. And so you'll see a lot less icons and a lot less um, menu items um, as things get condensed into um, a more simplified interface that uh, it's probably geared towards folks who are first using the application um, or for folks who are in the um, using it for for um, teaching with students. There'll be kind of a general version of the application, which will include um, uh, at a high level access to um, most of the, the tools in the way that it works now. but. Um, menus will be condensed and things will be moved into different locations and then there'll be kind of the expert interface which will be where it turns everything on and you kind of get an opportunity to you know find all of your stuff wherever you're at and so um, the, I, the hope is that by doing that it makes it a little easier for folks who are first using the application to kind of go through the process of, of figuring out what I do when I get a record for the first time because you don't have to deal with all the icons on the front page and all the menu items and stuff like that. And then as you go along, um, you can um, either change the interface in those kind of very large generalized categories or within the, um, this, uh, the new uh, settings area in the interface space, um, enable certain features based on um, your area of use. So that way, if you, for example, wanted to see the general workflow, but you don't do any work within, say, you know, XML processing, you could turn that section off and just be targeting the, the interface areas that you're, you're most, um, you're, you're most using. Um, though all of them will continue to be accessible to you, even if they're turned off because the, uh, mark edit, um, help, uh, portal, which I'm going to show you in a minute, um, cause I've kind of got a first version and the current version, um, will continue to provide access to all of the resources that are in the application. So even if you're in the simplified interface, you could still get access to the other content. Um, I'm looking at the way that the market editor works, particularly page loading. The application, um, because it works with very large files, it's used paging for a very long time. I always am looking to see if that continues to be the, uh, the best approach for working with the application. Um, uh, I know that places like Notepad Plus and Microsoft's update to Notepad allow for kind of like a streaming view of the file, so it's always open. There's some trade-offs to that because even within those two applications, there are maximum file sizes, and there really isn't within MarkEdit within the approach that's been taken. I'll still look at that. Um, I'm also probably looking at um, uh, making the editor tabbed um, because I run into instances where I would like to be able to have two windows within the same editor. 
um, and the ability to pull those tabs out and work with them more like a browser. So um, it's a bit of work to do, um, but I'm working on uh, making that happen. There are going to be some validator updates. I've been running into issues around encodings, um, particularly in um, uh, countries, uh, particularly in a number of Asian countries where I'm doing some consulting work with folks, where um, homegrown or local ILSs are exporting data in um, uh, Unicode 16 formats, which Mark isn't, doesn't support. And so the program is, I'm having to write a lot of um, workarounds to um, flatten that data back down to UTF-8 and then um, correct the data on the fly so that it can be loaded into um, current base systems. Um, looking to refresh the linked data vocabulary um, application work, so the places where it'll generate linking as well as doing headings lookups. Right now most of that is built around LC and a number of well-known vocabularies, partly because at the time that was what was available. Um, uh, there's been a number of other vocabularies that are available that are in uh, that are, that are accessible now through the framework, and so I'll be um, refreshing how that works and how those can be integrated. Uh, the tools building in on the task area, adding more conditional tools. So there are in the task section. There's some recursion tools. Um, I've been adding templating within the code to build if then statements um, so that uh, conditionals can be built within the tab the task process so that you can have um, different tasks run based on conditionals within the records so you end up getting branching within the task a little bit um, tricky because i need to make sure the tasks don't run on top of each other so um, i'm having to flesh out a little bit because uh, the initial work that i did i was creating a bunch of um, race conditions which was causing me problems so trying to get those sorted out so that those things are uh, so that when it finally gets to folks um, there'll be um, there will be guardrails around the application to essentially prevent people from accidentally uh, creating race conditions within the, the application. Um, and then the other thing that I'm working on, and this has been something that I've been using in um, real life for a while, um, but I'm looking to see how, um, if, if I can scale it, um, is for a while I've been, uh, within MarkEdit, I have been creating my own um, AI data models. Um, I use an open source AI tool to post all the data and the applications within my web infrastructure um, and pull the data because the models are too large to, to give to people. Um, but it's used primarily on a case by case basis for with folks that I work with for generating um, records on the fly for say like card catalogs where you have just images of cards um, or for large sets of documents, PDF documents, um, or Word documents, or um, anything that I can basically scrape and read. Um, so I've been working to see if I can get this into a place where um, it could be utilized by folks outside of these very narrow use cases where I'm controlling, I'm able to control how much data and how much uh, how much how many requests are going through this service that I've set up um, within the application if I can make it work it'll show up as a plugin within the application uh, what I envision is a tool um, I'm thinking about it in my at OSU in my work use case where potentially I could use it to um, generate metadata for the materials that we don't have time to create metadata for so um, an uh, example of that would be uh, within the archives, we, we get um, uh, every year uh, 100, about, about 100 uh, to this year, I think it was, it had been about 150 to half a terabyte of images from football games. I think this year we got 10 terabytes, eight terabytes of football photos. Um, a lot of them are the same. Um, we end up creating, we end up sampling those records and then creating data around them. Um, this process could be used to essentially create metadata records across the, the space, um, rather than having somebody go through and create individual records for hundreds of thousands of images, which we're all gonna look at basically the same. So uh, experimenting a little bit with that, um, it works 
pretty well in the use cases I've been using it for, which is, like I said, it more for helping libraries do remediation. Um, we'll see if it works within a, uh, a larger production context. Um, the other thing, the last thing that I'm working on is um, consolidating the help application. Um, you see kind of an initial look of what that looks like here within MarkEdit. Um, there's this thing called Ask Mabel. So um, Mabel is, my, is the unofficial um, lookup. So from here, um, I'm starting to consolidate um, how you can look up things within the application. So um, for example, how do I? So font size is macro. So there are questions that the program can answer for you and they'll take you to answers to those things. Um, you can ask it questions and it will um, look up the different knowledge bases that I have um, and see if it can find them. It'll also go out to the uh, listserv. Listserv is sometimes a little janky because it likes to uh, take a little time sometimes in getting back, but then it pulls the data together that it can find and puts it in a place for you to, uh, to be able to find it. So um, I'm trying to use this particular space um, to start building in um, more um, uh, help-based resources. Um, I also may at some point use this as a way to try and connect um, folks to more of like a real-time help. I'm not quite sure what that looks like yet, um, but that's kind of something also that I've been looking at um, in terms of how, how feasible something like that could potentially be. Um, so, all right, so let's go ahead and that's kind of the what's coming in the horizon. So let's go ahead and go forward. All right, so thinking about diacritics. So I get lots of questions um, about diacritics um, throughout the application, uh, about the application as we go through. And these tend to be cached in two different approaches. Um, one is I have um, bad diacritics uh, and I need to be able to find them. Um, the mark validator will actually do that for you. So um, that would be the way I would go about doing that. The other one is I've gotten data from um, a, a particular vendor or I've gotten data and they said it's in um, Unicode, but it's not rendering within my, my application. And a lot of times that tends to be because the data may not be in Unicode. It may be in ISO 8859, which is um, has a number of uh, spaces in the back end that are compatible with Unicode. So a lot of European countries will use that, especially in older systems, um, because if they don't use um, Unicode data beyond a certain point, um, it can uh, fall into Unicode systems as compatible. Within MarkEdit, things open as streams. So and uh, that stream is in a Unicode stream. So MarkEdit would um, prefer that you actually convert it to Unicode data. So within the tool, there's actually um, two different ways to, to use the application to help with character encoding. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and show you very quickly where you would find those things and how this kind of gets, um, how this kind of uh, shows itself up. So um, within MarkEdit, uh, there is, oh good, I had something running in the background. I'll show you that later. Um, within the application, um, there is in the tools this thing called character conversions so there are two places within the application two things within the application that are potentially helpful one is called character detection so character detection is actually kind of tricky um, especially when working with mark records because mark records don't identify their their character encoding they identify themselves as unicode or something else um, and so um, the uh, the way that the application um, will work uh, if you get a record and it doesn't identify as Mark 8 or Unicode, um, is it can go through a list of heuristics to try and determine what character encoding you may be using. Um, so I have a file that I grabbed, um, came from a, a place, let's see here. And I know what it is, it's in Big Five format, but um, uh, if I didn't, uh, I have this file um, and I can ask the program to detect it and it'll go through and make a best case guess at what the uh, the file format is. And here it thinks that there's potentially two file encodings. Well, both are um, uh, Chinese file encodings. Um, 
Big Five is actually the most prevalent. Uh, sometimes it gets confused between the two. You can ask it to detect in verbose results, and it'll show you a confidence level and what it thinks an individual um, character encoding is. So I can guess that the, the character encoding for this record is probably um, Big Five. Uh, so why do I care? So if I look at it in MarkEdit, um, a record set that's not in either Unicode or Mark 8, if you've MarkEdit enough, you've probably seen records show up that look like this. That look kind of like this. So these are records where the data is not in um, particular format, so Mark edits uh, chewing them out and spitting out the data in um, a format here that is, you know, more friendly for the application. Uh, this actually, let me see what I mean. Oh, let me see what I've got in my settings real quick. So that's not what I would have expected on this file unless I've made some changes to it. I must, uh, the file must be different than what I think it is. Um, well, we'll find out. So we're going to go ahead and convert it to Unicode. So um, go to my character encodings, conversions, uh, pick my record set, and I'm going to turn it to TF8. And I just have to tell it what the initial record encoding is. And in this case, it is Big Five. And I'm going to Unicode and I process it. And hopefully, record set looks like what I think it is. Now that turned the data into. I turn the data into something else. I've got, I grabbed the wrong file, sorry. I was grabbing my stuff. So uh, let me quickly grab the right file here. Oh, Jew, sorry. Uh, I moved, uh, I must have edited that file when I was playing around with it. This is very much like what we do, trying to find. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> trying to figure out why a particular file got wonky. All right. All right, let's uh, make sure this is the file that's in clear. Yeah, I'm going to have to see what's going on with my file. Um, I've, I've tweaked something here. I'm running a version, I'm running my test version of Markout and I'm wondering if I tweaked a, tweaked a file. So in what it should look like is when I run the Big Five file, it should look like this. This is what it would look like if it's in Big Five because this isn't a, this isn't a, a Mark 8 file. You can tell because there's no escapes within it. It's a Mark 8 is an escape based language. There's no escapes within the file. So using the character encoding tool you should be able to convert the data so that it turns it into the actual mark records. Um, I'm going to have to see, I'm going to take a closer look at that file and see what changed on, on me. So anyways, there's, there's that tool for character encodings. Um, but for most folks, they tend to not need to do those kind of character encodings from one encoding to another like that. They tend to be going from Mark 8 to UTF-8. Um, so within the application, there are compatibility um, formats. So you can, when you're compiling the application, um, if your data is in Unicode and you need it to be in Mark 8, you can just tell it compile it as Mark 8. Or if it's in Mark 8 and you need it in Unicode, you can just tell it to compile in Unicode. And the program will automatically uh, make that transition for you. Um, the other thing you can do within the applications, if you only are working with specific kinds of data or you only want to work with specific kinds of data, um, you can go into 
um, mark edit here and you can tell it that um, you want to compile records always within a certain encoding. Um, and that'll allow the program to know that when it's working with the data, your information is likely in either Mark 8 or Unicode, and it will utilize that assumption to um, build uh, the records during compilation into um, either uh, UTF-8 or uh, Mark 8. And I'm, I'll have to take a look and see what was kind of wonky there. I have a feeling I, I might know what happened. I was doing some tweaking because I've been working with some folks um, in uh, India, um, working with Bengali scripts, and they were working with some data that was um, a little bit off. And so I was working on the some changes to the validator to make the life work a little easier. So within MarkEdit, you can also use regular expressions to find unprintable data. Um, I went ahead and snapshot it here. This is what the expression would look like. I'm not gonna go through the expressions because you have them, but I wanted to put in the, the, the slides where you would find information about MarkEdit's regular expressions. I'm assuming most people probably have used them, but just in case the language references are here, printed copies, concepts, um, these are the ones that you use most often within Mark Edit, um, character escapes, classes, groupings, anchors, qualifiers, substitutions. A um, little bit beyond um, being able to spend, uh, you know, 45 minutes to talk about regular expressions, but um, within Mark Edit, a lot of the stuff that you end up doing ends up being regular expression based. And when you find one that you that works, you can share them with people. So Mark Edit has a place for you to store your expressions, your private expressions, and ways to share them with others. Um, it's a little tool in the application called the regular expression store. Um, this is also one of the things that will likely be getting a refresh within the updated application. Um, so uh, basically it's just a little window here. Um, you can search on uh, metadata or you can add the public store into it. So by default you see your, your private resources. Um, if you add the, the public store to it, you should see um, all the ones that have been um, put in that are publicly available. Um, from here, you can just take an expression and see what somebody's created for it. Um, and then you have actions where you can save it um, for as a personal resource, create a new expression. Or if you make an edit here, it will recognize the record's been edited and offer you an option to uh, save it in your personal store or to um, uh, capture it, uh, share it back to the community by uh, checking the share um, option there. Um, so that gives you the opportunity to keep track of expressions. Because I, I ended up putting that into the application partly because um, I was needing to have access to a lot of regular expressions I was writing for other people as uh, uh, examples and so um, ended up putting this in there so that I could have a, a private store of expressions that I was writing um, and ended up because uh, I had some folks wanting to be able to share them with other people that's where the public part came from. Uh, so task automation so um, Mark edits task automation has been built over the course of a number of years um, it's probably uh, I would like to think that this is a successful uh, way to automate applicate automate record management. Um, it's also the part that took me the longest, I think, to get to a point where people could actually use it. Um, because my my inclination when I originally started working with Mark Edit was I had hoped that everybody would become uh, programmers, and so um, Mark Edit uh, has always in the automation um, space. Uh, tried to drive people to um, be uh, developers. So either through uh, accessing the uh, application components through VBScript or Perlscript or PowerShell or whatever language you want to work with, um, to actually embedding at one point, though I stopped doing that because it wasn't, nobody was using it and it was really hard to work with, um, the entire uh, uh, .NET language into the application for working with it. Um, the more I worked with uh, folks trying to figure out automations, the more folks asked me if they could have something that worked a lot more like um, uh, the macro recorder that you find in connection. So this is probably the closest that you that I could get to that. Um, it's hard to do um, recordings of uh, actual um, uh, 
uh, like typing, uh, especially within Mark Edit because of the, the way the application is structured. But tasks allow you the ability to create um, kind of compact, uh, re repeatable um, uh, uh, operations that then, then can be done in either recursive or um, uh, a number of times currently, but will eventually have conditional management. Um, so I'm going to just pop Mark Edit open here. So within MarkEdit, the, the task management, um, which can be used in, in tools like the command line tool, you can actually call tasks from the command line uh, if you are automating it through a script. Um, task management lives under tools. Um, it's under the, this manage task space. Um, I try and keep things that are specifically task related on this side. So these are things like uh, cloning, deleting, editing, and creating and renaming tasks. Things related to management tasks live over here. Uh, you can share tasks with other users by exporting a selected task and importing a task through the file. If you were looking to ex if you were looking to share one task or an individual task, that would be the way to I would I'd do it. Um, otherwise, if you were looking to share uh, more broadly, the tool has uh, this was designed originally for. Um, folks when they move from one computer to another, um, but you can share um, task settings this way by exporting and um, exporting your defined macros and tasks. And when an individual imports these tools, it'll import this, those records. Um, you can also share tasks in a network space. Um, depending on if you work like in a, a shared local drive, um, you can do that through here. Um, you can set a network folder. So by default, the network folder points to your local folder on your computer. Um, you can point to a network folder. Um, it uses either UNC paths or a map drive path. Um, there's a latency timeout. It sets it to 300 milliseconds. That's usually fine for most places, um, but some networks will have longer latency, so it takes longer to, to, to determine whether or not uh, the network is available. Um, you can check that, set that to whatever works within your network space. And the way that Mark Edit's networking folders work then is it keeps a copy local of all the tasks that are networked. So that way, if you're off the network, it can continue to work. Um, but when you're on the network, it will synchronize the local tasks with the network tasks and it'll use the network tasks and it will edit, it will point you to edit the network tasks if you need to edit a, um, a task within the application. And then if you decide that you don't want to do that, you can always reset the path back to the local path and the program will go back to using um, local. Uh, so anyways, you can share your tasks. Um, Tasks are designed to, um, like I said, essentially be a little um, little applications. So you get a little interface here. Um, you can build them by scratch. So you do that through actions. So these are all the actions that are available to you. It tends to be all of the actions that are available within the applications tools window including and then also some of these things that are um, uh, uh, shortcuts so these are kind of encapsulated uh, tools that um, do very specific things that may be um, reliant on understanding the um, uh, mark 21 specification um, and so those get separated into kind of a separate space because mark edit works with a lot of different flavors of mark you know mark uh, you know uh, Mark 21, various things. So these would be places where you could do um, things. So you would uh, select your task, um, program turns the window pink, so you know you're not in the, uh, the normal task space. You know, you enter in what you want to do here, and then um, whatever, and then it creates your task. Um, if you need that task to happen recursively, you can right-click on it. Um, you can copy tasks and move them to other tasks. Um, or you can add a script action. And this is where the program is being filled out to add conditionals. So right now there are control flows. So you can add a counter loop so it'll do it a certain number of times. Or you can do it as a results loop where you're going to run this until the results equal zero. And so it'll re run that, that task over and over and over again. And the place where that ends up being really useful is in places where you have fields where you're going to be making replacements maybe um, 
uh, and you don't know the number of times it's going to run um, within uh, a specific record or on a specific field. And so you can use this um, recursive control flow to process the, uh, the, the number of times that a record, that that, that number of times that's going to run. So that way you don't have to just keep pushing replace, 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 replace. It can go through and do that work. Um, you can comment out things. So let's say when you're doing work, if something doesn't work the way you want it to, you can comment it out. And then when you want to put it back in, you can uh, put it back. Um, so the tool tries to create a space so that you can create kind of like little mini executable programs that um, are portable within um, all versions of MarkEdit. So as long as you're working roughly within the same version number, you should be able to import and export tasks into those, whether it's on the Mac side or the Windows side of things, or if you're running the, the Linux build, you should be able to use it in any of those. And I grabbed an example of one that I had worked on recently where um, I'm going to import. So I had exported the task. I will go ahead and import it. It's one I had worked on for somebody to create um, e-records from book records. So you can see the, uh, the way that the task gets set up is we have um, uh, a bunch of things that are being deleted. We're creating a new field based on data that's within um, various other fields within the record. Um, it's adding uh, fields, it's editing subfield data based on information that's in the record or not. Uh, you can see there's regular expressions being used, deleting fields, removing subfields, replacing fields, and then running the RDA helper at the end to kind of clean up stuff that uh, it wasn't there just in case the record wasn't created, it was an older record. Um, and so, you know, all that stuff is there. We have a debugging area. So if you've created your task and you want to see how it runs and if it's not running the way that you think it should run, you can run the debugger and the program will step through each one of the steps and tell you what the results are for each one of those steps and see the results of how those particular, that particular action completed. Um, so uh, it gives you the ability to be able to, to follow through and do those things. Um, the other automation thing that's been put in to mark edit, um, and this is really for me, um, though I'm trying to figure out how to document it for other people, is mark edit has the ability to run power scroll ships. PowerShell scripts. So this is so that I can actually script to the application and run things, load results into the editor, um, and work with resources outside of um, Mark Edit uh, a little bit differently than I can within the task editor. So sometimes when I have really complicated things to do or I need network access to resolve a bunch of data that's outside of Mark Edit and bring them into the editor, um, I may use the PowerShell scripts tool to do that. I've been trying to think about if there's ways to, within the task editor, I'm just not sure if this happens very often because um, my use case may be unique, where um, someone needs to go get data from a website and bring it into a record. Um, that's what, for me, the PowerShell tool works really well for, is I can go and collect data and bring it back in. Um, there could be facilities um, if that data is, if, because the, the way that, this works for me now within PowerShell scripts is there's a basically a template I use for the kind of work that I do that potentially that might be able to be something that could be replicated in the task um, but I have to take a closer look at how that might work uh, I need to pick up the pace uh, a little bit because I want to let you guys have a question all right task editor XML profiler I'm not sure how many people actually use this I'm going to leave this here um, uh, so the mark edit was designed to uh, facilitate uh, data coming from one format to another. The XML profiler is a way for folks to translate data without having to translate the data. Um, it's probably one of the, the, the tools that folks, folks aren't really aware of. Um, it was put together because I know a lot of catalogers sometimes get XML data, but they may not be able to or not want to create large XSLT files. So the way that the tool works is basically there's a wizard here. Um, I'm just going to so I, I grabbed a past perfect data file, which is kind of a funky little data file, just so you can see how this works. I'm not going to run it. So final formats mark. The way that the tool works is it pulls out a selection of the records so you can see kind of what the elements are. And essentially, you're just going to tell Mark Edit which element represents the record element. So in this case, it's this one. And then I'm going to go ahead and go forward. And then it works just like the delimited text translator. You're just mapping 
fields to fields. And then when you're finished, it creates a, a, a basically a profile that then gets loaded into MarkEdit and is portable within MarkEdit that then you can go and run um, to translate either um, XML or JSON based files into uh, uh, Mark format. Um, I'm going to let you guys, I'm just going to tell you about this. If people are interested, you can come back. We can come back to it. Um, MarkEdit does have a way to essentially automatically watch folders to do actions. Um, this is primarily used with vendor records, places where we get records from vendors, maybe on an FTP or an SFTP server. We want to process them with a set of tasks and then have them be finished. You can set up within MarkEdit a watch folder which essentially can be scheduled to go out to an FTP server, download whatever data is on the, the server, bring it into the folder, run a set of tasks or operations on it, and then output it into another folder um, where the data is essentially finished. Um, same thing can be true like if you were wanting to create mark records from ETD records. If you had the translation, you could have a folder where when an ETD record came in, the folders may be watching um, for every 15 minutes or scheduled to run once a day, would take all the data that's in that space, translate it um, through the, the appropriate XSLT, and then spit out the data into a mark record, uh, multiple mark records, or join them into a single file um, that then could be used later. Uh, essentially, the way that this works is it creates a service. Um, mark edit runs as a service in the background um, so it's, it's kind of a separate instance of MarkEdit that runs when you boot your machine up um, in order to run this kind of watcher functionality. Um, and then the last thing I'm going to talk about is um, some work that I started doing this year. So I'm looking at integrating, like I said, integrating different vocabularies. Um, so that's, I'm taking two different approaches to that. Um, the first one um, is probably what folks are more aware of if you've worked with MarkEdit's linked data tools. Um, there is um, in MarkEdit a linked data rules file. Um, that shows you um, the different vocabularies and how MarkEdit evaluates different um, uh, file uh, different fields and then determines whether or not it generates URIs for them, which this XML file is also used for um, heading validation, which you find here in the tool here for validating headings. Um, so if you wanted to take your mark records and find out if they're authorized within um, either LC or whatever vocabulary is noted in the subfield uh, 7, so long as uh, MarkEdit has a uh, vocabulary defined for it. The tool will go out and see if the vocabularies match, and if it does, it will um, you know, tell you what's, what's got a record in there and what doesn't, and then give you a report as best it can. Um, but there are also vocabularies that are being created um, that are um, uh, set up for use that um, uh, folks are using within their catalog. Um, so one of them is the uh, Homosaurus vocabulary. Um, this one's been created um, for by um, by the LGBTQ community. And so the records here show up in either um, XML or or JSON. Um, they're not in a format that's easily used within the library catalog. And so for a while I've been working with the folks to have like a workflow. Originally the workflow was kind of janky. Um, it was a, uh, a, a terminal program that I had written um, and put on GitHub that basically kind of walked through a process for downloading the records, translating the records from um, the flavor of JSON that you get into a kind of um, static XML format, and then from that format into MARC, um, so that you would essentially end up with subject authority records that you could load into your catalog and use as uh, subject authority records. Um, for record sets like this, I've been working on a framework that allows me to create really quickly um, these kind of um, vocabulary processors that should allow 
for me to be able to create instances where you should be able to point to uh, the path to a particular file. So in this case, this is going to the large JSON file that um, represents uh, the database. So I'm going to just pull that really quick. It'll take it a second. I'll let that run in the background. So basically, it'll pull the JSON record that um, that represents the vocabulary. So this is something that some, I don't know, maybe there's some library catalogs can use. I know our innovative one couldn't make use of it. Um, and so from there, I need to be able to take that data and move it into a, a format that can be used by mark-based systems. And so that's what the tool here facilitates. If you um, select save file, you can save it either in XML, so that'll be in a mark XML format, or just tell it you want to translate the data to mark, and it'll dump it into a mark-based format. Um, and then if you want to see all the process as it does it, you can tell it to show the debug information, um, or you can just keep it checked and it'll just work until it finishes. It takes a little while. This is a large file, um, as you can tell, because it's sitting here spinning in the background, uh, waiting to pull the data up. Um, I went ahead and downloaded it uh, before our session, and the process took, um, if I remember right, the process took about uh, 10 minutes to go through. But in the end, what I end up with is I end up with a, uh, a mark file that represents the data in um, an authority file format. So there's 3,086 records. Some are uh, that then are translated that can be used within um, my library catalog. And all of the records that are there within the tool are templated so that you can edit the, the templates um, and change the way that the conversion happens. So within the tool, um, because I realize uh, other people make, may make other decisions around how they process the data um, or how they may want the, um, the, the output um, for those subject records to work, um, you can find the templates inside of here. Uh, these templates that uh, define how the individual fields are generated. Um, and if you wanted to add a field, you could just add a new template and then you just edit. Um, you just edit this template here and then that sets up the, the determines what records come in and out of the system. All right. So that's the resource list for things that are uh, where you can find the documentation where the listserv is. Um, and that is uh, all the stuff I was going to talk about. I did not leave as much in time as I would hoped for to answer questions, but I'm not going anywhere, so I am happy to answer any questions that folks might have. Well, you have certainly had a lot of conversations while you were presenting about ways that people have used MarkEdit or thinking about using MarkEdit and even scripting. So you're getting a lot of oohs and ahs. I'm very excited about the changes that are coming too. Yeah, hopefully those will be useful. Um, spending a lot of time right now on it. Uh, it'll be the Windows version will come out first. Um, the Mac version will be second because it's uh, uh, the uh, interface changed significantly in Sonoma. And so sure. there's some stuff that has to be adjusted. But yeah, that's I'm, I'm looking forward to spending. I'm actually looking forward to spending the summer doing uh, doing a lot of this work. <laughs> Well, we want to make sure that we're watching that. So you've got a whole beauty of testers here for you that'll have you to try things out. Um, we do have a specific question here, and this is about scripting. So I guess this is back to the sure. maybe the PowerShell. It's coming from Jeremiah. He says he's mm -hmm. doing a bunch of scripted stuff, just Bash and Linux using Mono, a lot like the folder watcher that you demoed. Mm -hmm. He says there's a command line flag to check for duplicates, but as far as he can tell, uh, only whether duplicates are likely. His question is, is there any chance of getting it to spit out some data about those maybe? Um, Maybe a duplicate. I, yeah, I can take a look. Um, the other thing is I might need to take a look and see if it already happened, if it already works. So mark edit. So since you're using mono, you're using an older version. So um, I, I don't know if I, I'm, I know they're on the server, but I may not have changed the link. So on the Linux version, um, the full 
So if you need to use the the interface, I'm telling people just use Wine um, because it's it's diff it's it's just not worth it to me to recode the entire interface in in something else. But the command line tool is now a native Linux application. Um, it's compiled using uh, .NET has the ability to compile um, to work directly with Linux, so you no longer have to use Mono. It's actually compiled just to run as a, a Linux file, and so um, I'd have to look and see if the uh, if that switch was already made available because that means that um, um, if you're still using mono you're still you're using a slightly old version okay. yeah and I think Jeremiah just followed up and said no his files are headless so that uh, okay it, it, yeah so it sounds like a kind of specific thing but assume that's something he could follow up with you on yeah yeah you can go ahead and, and follow up I'll take a look and see because yeah like I said the the change happened because we were we actually uh, I needed to be able to the um, part of the, the the benefit of moving from the .NET framework to .NET Core is everything's running natively now um, within the uh, the particular operating system without having to um, uh, intermediate between a, a different runtime, sure. and it also means I can compile down to native code if I um, if I uh, in in certain cases, and so for like the Linux version, um, it's compiled to um, it's not compiled to byte code. It's not compiled to native code, but it's compiled to code that's basically already compiled for the processor. So it should be should be faster to start up, but all of the assemblies that need to be there are there, and so there's no need to have any other runtimes. Okay, fantastic. Okay. I am watching the clock. We don't have anything else starting on this track, but we do at the top of the hour. So I do just want to make a couple of notes here. One of the biggest things that you got a lot of thank yous for here is the regular expression store. Because as catalogers, I think that just trying, there's a lot of trial and error going out mm -hmm. on regular expressions. So having that, being able there to see what others have shared and then having it in one place has been extremely helpful. It's something that some of us just found this week. So it's been like Christmas, really, <laughs> trying to find that. So a big thank you for that. Um, let's see, we've got some other things. Let's see, um, Jeremiah, Jeremy again. Uh, he says, safe to assume the folder watcher can do SFTP, SCP, yeah, all S using keys. So it's SFTP, and I would need to check and make sure it works with keys. All of the examples I have uh, are password based, so that's been um, how I've coded it. Um, but I have to check and see. Um, I don't. I, I have a FTP. I'd have to set up an FTP server with a key, and I may have to set up a, a an option to accept it. Um, but right now, I have. Um, most of the FTP servers that I work with with vendors are all password based. So that was what the, uh, that was how it was set up initially, because that was the, the use case. Yeah. Fantastic. Yeah, I think you'll probably have some follow up there. Um, a lot of thanks coming in here. I, I, at this point, I guess I'd want to say we will make sure that we share the slides with everyone mm -hmm. that attended. Actually, we'll just put them on the web, the, the conference website. And then I want to make sure that we get, I will pull that resources slide that you had, and there were several actually.